Welcome back, everybody, to the second part of our uh, virtual Playbook Live interview this afternoon with uh, my guest, Margrethe Vestar, the Executive Vice President of the European Commission for uh, a Europe Fit for the Digital Age. I'm so delighted to have you here in person, socially distanced, of course, Vice President. But very uh, happy to be but here. But it's been a while uh, that we could do something like that in person, indeed. So I'm, I'm very delighted. Thank you all, uh, our viewers online, for following us this afternoon. Uh, let me just uh, give you a few housekeeping remarks before we kick things off. I would like to uh, let you know that there is a poll still up and running from the first part of our interview this uh, morning, later today, uh, earlier today. The question is, should the EU impose a strict quota for gender parity, so parity uh, as in 50%, on boards of listed companies? Uh, this is where we left it at before we started off here. 270 people already participated. This poll will be running all through uh, the next 35 or 40 minutes of our interview here. So please, if you have not done so, uh, let us know what you think. You can join at slido.com uh, under the hashtag Playbook Live, which is also the best way, actually the only way, for you to ask questions, which we will come to later during the interview. Uh, I would like to encourage you to also tweet using the Playbook Live hashtag. Uh, that is what I need to say. And then I would like to give the floor to our partner Sales, Salesforce, which I thank very much, and introduce Amy Weaver, the President and Chief Financial Officer of Salesforce, who will have a short message for us on video. Hello everyone, my name is Amy Weaver and I'm the President and Chief Financial Officer at Salesforce. It is my great honor to introduce today's conversation with Margrethe Vestager, Executive Vice President of the European Commission for a Europe fit for the digital age. At Salesforce, equality is one of our highest values. And the first step in driving gender equality is to have brave, authentic conversations on the issues women face. And those conversations, like the ones taking place at this very event, are evidence of a mutual focus on equality and empowerment. We're proud to be here today and want to thank the team at Politico and everyone tuning in for the opportunity. The unfortunate truth is that women still remain underrepresented in leading positions, including the EU's largest companies, where only 8% of CEOs are women. And globally, women hold only 4.4% of CEO roles. This is a complex situation that requires multifaceted solutions. To truly build a workplace that looks like society, women need to be represented at every level, particularly in the C-suite. This requires supporting women at all stages of their careers through investment in leadership development programs and inclusive promotions processes. Fairness in treatment, equal opportunity, recognition of success, and especially amplification of visibility will bring more women to the decision-making table and inspire more to rise through the ranks. In fact, data shows that customers and employees expect companies to drive equality and that equality has a tangible, positive impact on the bottom line. At Salesforce, we have created employee advocacy programs to help support and empower women and other groups of employees through confidential conversations with advocates around issues of belonging, equity, and career navigation. We're also proud to have women like Neely Cruz, the former European Union Commissioner on our Board of Directors. Her work, along with that of Margrethe Vestager, Cecilia Malmstrong, and so many others, exemplifies what can be accomplished when women occupy senior roles. The career path of these women must be something that every company, every government, and every organization should aspire to recreate. And with that, I am very excited for everyone to hear from Margrethe Vestager. Thank you very much, Amy Weaver, for these introductory remarks. Vice President, 
we are having this conversation in the times of a pandemic and a lot of data suggests that women are bearing uh, the biggest burden of this. It's uh, Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, only this weekend said uh, that we need to be careful because we're risking to fall back into old road patterns in, in this pandemic. Uh, and I quote her, it's mainly women again who are uh, mastering the balancing act between homeschooling, childcare and their own jobs, as, uh, as she said in her, in her podcast. How serious do you reckon is this pandemic-induced backlash uh, in, 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 in these times? Well, first and foremost, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here in person. And, um, and I think, well, the risk is quite big because since progress is so slow, when you have something terrible happening like the pandemic, of course, the setback is really strongly felt. Uh, because more women are hit by unemployment uh, caused by the pandemic and the lockdown. Uh, women will have to juggle many more roles, uh, put that into one life. Um, many more women are suffering from uh, domestic abuse uh, and violence. And then on top of things, you have this paradox that the majority sort of, of frontline workers, uh, nurses, uh, care personnel, they are women. But when you look at sort of the uh, corona um, committees, uh, coordinating bodies in, in many, many, many countries, huge majority have no gender parity, parity or are led by men. Uh, I think um, some 80 something percents, uh, you would find that they are led by men. So it, it affects women everywhere, but you don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Uh, uh, a, a supreme example uh, of a of a woman of a woman leader uh, who said who said this is Angela Merkel, with her 15 years in in government and in this job, uh, a role model for for you. Yes, she is in in many ways. I find her her approach really uh, inspiring because she's not a a leader who wants to you know up front with a. Uh, with the flag, uh, she seems to be a leader who will uh, listen well, make sure that the data, fact, uh, different evaluations of a situation comes to the table, and only then sort of assess the situation and say, well, the way forward may be this, so that things are balanced. Uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, also, in, in a situation under her leadership uh, where Europe has been now challenged really seriously twice, first during the financial crisis uh, and now during the pandemic, two crises that are extremely different uh, in nature. Uh, but I think one common denominator is that our societies are really challenged when it comes to political leadership. Angela Merkel is a, is a leader, as you said, who also very carefully chooses her words. Uh, so it was a, a rare occasion when she, um, two years ago, gave an interview, a long interview, where she talked about her role as a woman. And she said, I am not a feminist. She did not claim that, that title. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of that because you said she's not waving the banner. Are you a, consider, do you consider yourself a feminist? Yes, I do. Uh, and, and for me, it's important uh, because it's, uh, it says that you, you are you're in the fight for equal opportunity. Uh, and I think it's important also to, to broaden the idea as to what is feminism, uh, not to allow anyone sort of to occupy the label and mm -hmm. say, well, this is exactly what it is, but to make sure that it's, it's a broad, broad movement and men as, when, as well as women uh, can join. What is the, or who is the, uh, the most impressive woman in politics, the most impressive role model you had when you uh, pursued your, your own career? Well, one of, the, one of the women that always come to mind uh, would be Madeleine Albright. Uh, when I was very young, starting off in politics, uh, we had the Balkan Wars. And, um, and she took, you know, the initiative to convene uh, European leaders uh, to find a solution. And she didn't have to, has to. It, it was not in her, her portfolio, uh, but she did it anyway, uh, out of sort of a sense of belonging in a European reality. Um, and she did something and she did it, uh, you know, 
in a consistent uh, manner, and I think she was instrumental uh, as to the, the piece that eventually was, uh, was found. Uh, and I find that very impressive. She's very impressive still. Uh, and obviously, uh, from her quote, and something I, I strongly believe in, that, uh, that there is a special place in hell for women who do not help other women. Is that something that you have ever encountered in your, in, in your career? A woman who did not help other women? Maybe not so directly, but I think there is a, a tendency also among women uh, that we have biases just as well as, as men would have biases uh, as to, for instance, what is, uh, what is leadership? What is the voice of a leader? How does the leader look? Uh, what do you have to do? Um, so I, I, I find it really important to keep going back and look at oneself and one's own uh, biases. Uh, so in, in that respect, you know, probably also I have not always been as helpful uh, as I could be. Uh, and I think that is important to re-examine one's own uh, view of the world. What's your best piece of advice for, uh, for young women who want to, make a, to build a career in, in politics? Well, I can say what worked for me, uh, which, which was to, uh, to take chances and, uh, and to say yes to the thing that, that sort of came my way. Um, and I thought about it the other day because it is still so seemingly that if a man sees a job description and, and he sort of says, well, I can do three out of seven, this is my job, I will be perfect at it. <laughs> uh, many women, they will say, oh, I can, I can tick seven out of seven, but maybe it's not for me, probably. And I think, mm -hmm. no, come on, go, go, go. Uh, and the second thing uh, would be, uh, again, to, to form a network, to have someone to talk to, to, to lean on when things are tough, to celebrate with when things are amazing, um, because everything becomes easier if we help one another. Is there a, a trick in the Nordics? Uh, there are many uh, women, many female prime ministers. There's, uh, I discussed that with uh, Cecilia Malmström before. Sweden is the only country in the EU that sends more female than male uh, uh, members to the European, mm. uh, to the European Parliament. What's the, what's the trick? I think at least part of the trick is that um, many men have sort of uh, seen that parenting is a, is a great thing to do. So you have a different kind of, um, of balance uh, in the home. Uh, not to try to be a better mother than the mother, but to try to be a full father and a full present mm -hmm. father. Uh, I think that is part of it. Um, because we need to, to sort of uh, reinterpret our lives. In my family, we, li we live a different life than in my home, but my home was also different from my grandparents' home. So I think part of the trick is the fact that you have new roles in, in parenting, but also that you have uh, good uh, childcare, also from the early ages, and a quite good sort of work-life balance. And I think that is, is what gives a lot of, uh, um, a lot of courage and, and willingness uh, to, to go out there and, and test yourself and prove yourself. Do you think there is an element of, um, uh, uh, of public pressure uh, that would be helpful? Or uh, actually the question is how can that be created um, uh, to not present for parties, political parties, to not present uh, election lists where uh, there is Uh, which are far from gender parity. Is that something um, that we need more? Well, I think there are, there are different ways of, uh, of doing it. And, and sometimes your, your voters will also, quotas or no quotas, they would just decide. Uh, my party never had uh, quotas as such when, when I grew up, and yet we had more or less parity in, in the group in Parliament because of the way people voted. Others have had... Uh, quotas and that has worked for them. Uh, others ag again has not had it. Uh, I think it's it's really important that it's it's an open discussion in in every uh, sort of political congregation. Uh, how do we, if it's one of your values, of course, how do we make this happen? And if it is one of your values and you talk about it, that you also do something about it. 
Is there uh, coming back to the to the impact of the pandemic on on our societies? Uh, is is a lesson learned that we need to uh, look more closely at the the differences in the impact on on men and women of of a crisis like that, also of regulation of new of new laws. I think so, and and this is why we will do uh, when we do impact assessment of proposals by by the European Commission, uh, we will also assess the, the gender impact. Uh, and that will also push for more data to be available. And, and one of the keys is, of course, to have the data to see what is going on. I think that is one of the reasons why sort of the, uh, the gender pay gap has been one of the things that we talk a lot about, because we have good data. Mm -hmm. and, and if we assess also what would be the effect on genders of this proposal or that proposal, that will force us to find data to say, well, what, what will actually be Uh, the den gender issues in, in these proposals. Um, otherwise, it's invisible. And, uh, and I think it's important because um, still in, in many countries there are different roles. Still in, in many countries, women would have the primary sort of role of, of caring in the home, spend more time with the children, do more of the work uh, in the household. And, and if that is the case, then you really need to know how, how things actually uh, affects, affects people. You talked about the, the gender pay, pay gap uh, proposal that is, that is out there. Um, do you uh, imagine that to you know, sail through uh, the, the co-legislators smoothly, or is that something that you would expect to meet hurdles and, uh, and resistance? Things with gender is never smooth, <laughs> never ever smooth. Uh, we still have the, the proposal on quotas pending since 2012. Um, it, it took quite some, uh, some effort uh, to give men their own uh, parental leave. So no, I, I, I don't think that it will be smooth. Um, we tried to make room for, for national differences uh, so that only quite big companies at least they would be big in a Danish context because it's more than 250 employees, uh, that if you are a smaller company so that you do not get uh, too close to things that would be problematic within the, the GDPR or privacy rights. But uh, I think it will, there will be a lot of discussion about it. What's your uh, best guess when the, uh, you mentioned the quota proposal that mm. is uh, out there since, has been out there since uh, 2012 or 13? For, for years, and is blocked in the in the council. Uh, is that something that you would that you think uh, is going to be done by the end of of this mandate as uh, of the current commission? Well, at least we will push for it, um, and and I think there is also a, a it's a credible push because it's a gender balanced uh, commission, and um, I myself have grown into being a strong believer of quotas. Uh, because I realized that there's been informal quotas for men for centuries, and it has worked very well. <laughs> uh, up to a level of 95, 98%. So I think the, the male part of, uh, of the population should just accept the 50% and run with it. Because if, if there should be any fairness, of course, we should have 70% for next 100 years. Any fairness, uh, historically speaking? Yes. Can you give me one example of uh, of what it uh, how it would look like if you uh, focused more on, a, on on the if the impact assessment would be done by by gender, for example, uh, in tech in your wider portfolio? What's the how can we imagine that to look like? Well, I think it's 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 interesting in in many ways because technology uh, influences everything we do in life. Uh, and by now, even more than than ever. So it's uh, it is it is work, it is socializing, exercising, shopping, everything. Uh, and yet, it's a it's a very sort of non-diverse community who is building the technology for us. Um, so so one of the things we're in the process of making a proposal for uh, artificial intelligence that we can trust. And here, of course, it's a big thing uh, because if If data are biased, then there is a risk that the result that the artificial intelligence will give you will also be biased or even increase that bias. So, so here, the gender perspective is really important to make sure that we can correct for that uh, when artificial intelligence works in order to be able to trust it. Um, when it comes to sort of data strategies, to make sure that we have data available and not to be blind 
that there, is, there are some things for which we do not have data. Uh, I think that is another imp important perspective uh, in, in doing that. And how can that be addressed, for example, the, the, the as you say, non very uh, diverse community that, uh, that builds and that codes uh, AI solutions for us? Well, part of it is, of course, for, for more women uh, to have the relevant educational background. Uh, that is improving, but very, very, very slowly. Um, I think that is important because just imagine if we had a, uh, if the European Parliament had the same sort of composition as the tech community, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't talk about anything else mm -hmm. because we would find that to be a scandal that they could legislate for, for everyone uh, being so non-diverse. Uh, so it's, it's for, uh, for member states to, to encourage, to figure out what kind of programs, what kind of encouragement uh, to have for more women to get uh, sort of also the coding qualifications, but maybe also for the tech sector to, to open up as to what does it take uh, to be a tech designer. Because also coding and, and creating new services is a completely different matter today than it was 30 years ago when I tried to learn to code. Did you successfully do so? Only as an absolute beginner. But you know, it, it's kind of interesting to just have a sense of how it actually works. Mm -hmm. I would like to come to some questions from the audience, actually, uh, which is why I'm looking there, because there they are. Um, as, to, as a liberal politician, uh, Vice President, what does your own party, Renew Europe or, or ALDE, uh, do to support gender equality and promote women in politics? Uh, I, I think since I'm not <laughs> directly involved, I think I, I can praise them to say I think they, they do quite a lot. Uh, from the very specific to have sort of a, an, an academy for women in politics, uh, to promote them, to create a network, uh, to give you know tools to be there. Um, for instance, to, to deal with uh, online hate speech uh, that may be an impediment for even uh, wanting to join politics. Mm. Uh, but also in the, in the different politics, uh, the group in the European Parliament is very, very active uh, on all kinds of gender issues. So, uh, no, I, I think they are, they are quite good. Um, another liberal, uh, the president of the European Investment Bank, uh, Werner Hoyer, says Europe must lose its naivete over Chinese firms winning contracts for EU development projects in Africa. Is he right? A very different question. Mm, and what was it again? Uh, uh, that Europe must be uh, less naive over, uh, over China and Chinese uh, influence in Africa is the question. Well, I, I have no judgment of whether we are naive or not, um, but I definitely think that we could have a, a very different presence. Um, that was the reason why the entire college uh, went to see the, the African Union Commission just before things closed down in, in Europe last year um, in order to establish also a personal relationship uh, with the people of the African Commission. And, and one of the thought-provoking things is that, if I get the numbers right, uh, when China invests one euro, uh, Europe would invest five only we are so much more shy when it comes to sort of promoting uh, our engagement. And, and here I think we could do much, much more. Uh, and that engagement, I find that crucial because they are neighbors uh, and a strong partnership with, uh, with the African Union and African countries is key to many things in Europe. Do you think that is going to, uh, that push, the very remarkable push of the new commission and the president uh, and that, that first trip that went to, to Africa and to see the African Union immediately will survive this, this crisis? Yes, I, I definitely think so because, you know, it's, I was, uh, I was, when I was there, I was traveling to, uh, to Nairobi uh, to meet the government and the uh, startup in environment and there was a bus. There was a sense of, uh, of dynamic. This is, this is where things are happening. Uh, and the more we can connect, I think we can also inject uh, more dynamics in, in how we do things. We are a graying continent. Uh, the fact that in a few years, a uh, few def decades, uh, half the world population will live on the African continent and four to five percent will live in Europe. I think that in itself is a very good driver for us to engage uh, fully. 
there is uh, a question on enforcement of the plans that we were talking about before. Um, how to ensure that good intentions are translated into action, actually plans, policies and funding that will have a positive impact for women, for example, on the gender pay gap, on women on boards uh, and so on, is the question of Claudia de Castro. Well, I think that is one of the core questions, uh, because uh, a communication is just a communication, a proposal is just a proposal, legislation is just a legislation. If it's not enforced, you could have saved uh, the efforts. So uh, one of the things, of course, is to do the follow-up to make sure the things are fully uh, implemented. And that is a priority for, for this commission, uh, also for legislation that was passed in the previous uh, commission, uh, in order for, for the reality actually to change. But of course, to, to see the, the pay gap with your own eyes because of pay transparency, uh, of course, in itself doesn't change anything but that you act upon it once you have the knowledge, that will change things. Uh, I just learned that um, in my home country where there has been a level of pay transparency for quite some time, researchers looking into that find that there is actually an, an element of improvements that can be led back to the fact that there is more transparency. Is there, um, I'm referring to this question, do you think that the economic argument as gender parity is good economic thinking, uh, as uh, someone's quoting Vice President Vera Jourova here, is the right approach to equality? Well, there can be many different motives. Uh, for me, it's just plain, fair, square fairness that there are equal opportunity, because we're, we're the same, we're humans. Uh, if someone needs to add on an, an economic uh, line of arguing, I don't care, it's true. Uh, it seems like uh, that during the financial crisis that the businesses with, with a gender parity or, or women on board, they did better uh, than if it was not the case. So, uh, so it's true and if, if someone needs that kind of convincing, well, run with it. Is that a way to get some men on board who would otherwise not would I not come on board with uh, things like that? Well, I, I find that a bit strange because I, I would think that uh, that every man with a, with a mother would think that it was a good idea, that there were equal opportunities because why shouldn't your mother be more respected uh, than your father and, and be able to, to do th things uh, with their having an education, using your education, having your own uh, bank account with your salaries coming in or starting a business. Um, I, I really do think that this is for men as well as, as women. Um, also because equal opportunities give so much more space for, for the differences in, in who we are and how we define ourselves. So it's also a road to breaking down stereotypes. Uh, and that I, I think is a, is a really promising and encouraging perspective for our society that if you can break down the stereotypes, we can have so much more richer lives. Yeah. We touched upon this before, but there's a follow-up question uh, on, on your portfolio. Please could you describe why it is important to, uh, to mainstream gender equality in your portfolio, so to make it uh, the, the base of, of every police policy in initiative? Well, I think it's Im important. If you look, for instance, at... Uh, at competition and the effect of competition in, in an open market so that you have affordable prices, uh, you have choice, uh, you have innovation. Um, that would serve, I think, also women. Uh, in, in a number of countries, women would be responsible for uh, the household budget, for, for a kindergarten, uh, for having taken care of yeah, a lot of the care work. And here, of course, for, for the market also to deliver uh, into that, uh, would be a, a key issue uh, and that women as a consumer are there in their same right as men are there as a consumer. Uh, and here maybe that is one of the areas where, where there is actually a sense of, of the market not really distinguishing because consumer purchasing power is, uh, is one of the few things that, that the market actually do respect. Um, there's one more about your knitting, sorry, that I would like to take. Do you have the proposals to address the social prejudices for mothers and adjusting the workplace uh, time need pressures? Oh, there was a knitting, I thought, sorry, I didn't really see that. Well, the, 
the, the point is that equal opportunity is not becoming the same. And, uh, and I, I really do love a number of sort of old school women's things uh, to do. I love to cook, I love to knit, I lo love to sew, uh, I love to do a number of things. And I would like to bring that in uh, to who I am as a, as, a, as a vice president, also because dressing up more or less as a man cheats no one. Mm. You know, in a, in a male environment, they will know very well that you're not a man. So, uh, so better come as who you are and, and bring that difference uh, to the table. Mm -hmm. I, I know that it provokes some, but I find it equally provocative when people cannot resist fiddling with their phone. <laughs> have, have people told you that it is provocative to, to knit in, in No, but, but sometimes I sense it as if, uh -huh. uh, as if you're not present. And, and yet there are other things that we accept where you are really not present. If you're double screening, you're not present. Um, so I, I think it's, it's important that we also push and, and play, well, what does it actually mean? Because being concentrated, listening to other people, Uh, is a skill, and um, and if you, we have to do it in, for a long time, I think most people they would, in the best of cases, doodle. Mm -hmm. In the worst of cases, start to double screen. Mm -hmm. I would like to come back to uh, th to the the conversation uh, the two of us are having here, and of course I have the the screen here in mind. You mentioned it before. You yourself are a part of the first gender balanced European Commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is an achievement that um, but I don't know whether it was appreciated enough. Um, but you, that you have been uh, a member of the previous commission already, is there a difference between the two? Well, first and, and foremost, it is thanks to the president. If she had not insisted that every country should come up with a male and a female candidate, this would not have happened. And, uh, and it took a lot of efforts uh, on her side uh, to make it happen. Uh, and I think that is uh, overlooked already now. We take it for granted. Yeah, well, but of course. Um, and I think there is a, there is a change in, in atmosphere because just the fact that we look different, it's simply, it's a more, it's a more colorful uh, commission. And, and when, you, when you look at diversity, I think it also affects uh, how your brain works, uh, what you say. Um, of course, it's still a bit tricky to, to test in real life because we are so separated. We, of course, we have the physical college meeting, but it's with masks and it's with phys social distancing and everything. But, but I think there is a different atmosphere. Does that have to do with, uh, with leadership style or... Uh, um And is, is there a different uh, leadership, uh, female leadership? Well, I think we have to test it over the next three, four, five uh, commissions with female leadership. Then we have a better sort of sense of comparison. Are you going to, to run again for commission president? I, I really have no idea. Right now, I'm so busy as I have never, ever been before uh, in this job. Um, because of well, my portfolio is somewhat broad, um, but also because of, uh, of the state aid work that we do and the policy work that we do. So I'm, you know, completely focused. Also because I've always thought that whatever your next job, it's only going to be a good job if you're focused on what you do right now, because otherwise people would think that you would... Not I think be I've heard good. that before from you. Yes, <laughs> and it worked so well so far. <laughs> Um, so that was a plea for uh, make it uh, make it normalcy that uh, the commission is led by by a woman. Um, also, because we have had quite a number of commissions that were led by men, so I think we can have quite a number of commissions led by women before anyone sort of thinks of that as not being balanced. Uh, speaking of how to become commission president, just, just briefly, uh, do you think we will see another round of uh, of lead candidates of Spitzenkandidaten next time we get to we getting to this? Well, that I, I don't know. Now the Conference of the Future of Europe seems to sort of actually to, to get started. Uh, and that entire process, I think, will be one of the first considerations on, uh, on their side. 
And I think it's really important uh, to talk it over also uh, really broadly among member states so that everyone has their expectations adjusted uh, as to what will actually happen, how are we going to go through these procedures the next time. Is this speaking um, from, from your own experience, um, as as the face of a campaign for for the liberal uh, for the liberal political family, uh, which did not fully embrace the, the concept mm. of the Spitzenkandidat, um, what would be needed to, uh, as you said before, as you just said, uh, to make it uh, a shared concept, to make it something that everybody has their expectations cleared before uh, we go into the elections. Well, one of the really tricky things with uh, with having a lead candidate is is to make it a thing in every member state, mm -hmm. because member states are so different with different sort of uh, political traditions. Also, when it comes to what is what are the dynamics of also uh, campaigns for the European Parliament, so to to make that connection that because I I vote for the Social Liberal Party in in Denmark, that is also voting for a lead candidate coming from another kind of liberal, social liberal party from a completely different country, that to, con to create that connection, I think that is the tricky point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still some time until the next European yes. election, so, uh, uh, but you mentioned that the Conference of the Future of Europe, so you're confident that it will kick off and, and also uh, wield meaningful results in the end? Well, re remains to be seen, but at least now something uh, is actually happening. Uh, when it comes to the conference, and uh, and I think it's these may seem sort of trivial issues in in the big uh, scope of things, but I think it is quite important that we discuss what would be sort of the election the next time. Can we also push for cross uh, country or, or pan European lists so that people can vote to a larger degree from to, on candidates from a different country? If we want to to create that connection between what you vote and, and who is going to be uh, the president of the commission. And that it will take time to prepare that, that would, you would need to have a much longer uh, sort of campaign style uh, running up to the European election if that was to be sort of more established, I think, uh, among voters. Uh, coming back to your, uh, as, as you said, massive portfolio, which is basically uh, what you had in the previous commission, plus a lot more. Uh, uh, That's a very accurate description. Uh, plus a lot more, um, among which the you know t two very uh, two very important uh, legislative projects, the the DSA and the DMA. Um, what makes you uh, confident that uh, Facebook or Google or others will, in the end, comply with the Digital Services Act when it's uh, apparently already very difficult to make them uh, f uh, comply with the, or everybody, anybody, um, to enforce the, the last commission's big project, the GDPR, the, uh, the data protection rules. But I think the, the GDPR is, is slowly but surely uh, taking a stronger and stronger foothold. Uh, it was new, it was complex, uh, but I think with the enforcement structure, it bit gets more and more sort of tangible. What is this? Uh, and as with one of the questions before, of course, it's really high priority uh, for our sort of digital citizens' right to be a mm. real thing. Because it's a good thing to know that you have rights. It's even better if you can enforce them. Um, the, the thing is here um, that what we have been trying to do is to make both the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act sort of asymmetrical, so that you are, if you are affected uh, by these two pieces of legislation as a small company, it's because you get a better opportunity of making it in the market, not because you get more sort of bureaucracy and, and more rules to apply by, but that it's for the bigger ones to say, well, we, we grew into market power, and with that market power comes responsibility. Uh, and with the new sort of line of thinking when it comes to enforcement with the country of origin and the country of destination of services um, and with the different tools in the Digital Markets Act, uh, I definitely think that we will be getting there. It is also um, Europe's answer to, uh, to threats to democracy, mm. people have said. As now some argue um, 
that it's uh, not only market size, but it's the, the concept of surveillance capitalism that, mm. is, the, that is the biggest threat. Um, how does it, or why does it not, uh, rain into, into the business model of the advertising business model online? Well, it's not only these two proposals. We also have the, the European Democracy Action Plan uh, and, and the media plan, uh, both with uh, Vera Jourova as responsible. Um, so it's, it, it takes quite a big push. But what we are trying to deal with are, are the problems coming, for, for instance, from targeted advertising. But, but in our suggestion not to ban it completely, because some smaller businesses, for them, actually it's, a, it's an affordable way of finding potential customers. But trying to sort of take out uh, the part of it that can be toxic, because it's, it's intransparent, because it's for you only, uh, so that other people other people, vetted researchers, for instance, can have access to see, well, what is actually going on here? So that instead of, of we have sort of this targeted, um, especially sort of political advertising, in a very close room sort of to open the doors for that uh, and have a more, uh, more transparent approach to sort of move it more out in public space. Because one of the big problems of, uh, of the situation right now is that with targeted advertising in the sort of political uh, aim, you basically privatize public space. And, and with the transparency and, and with the, the insights uh, that the proposal would entail, that we sort of break that privatization of public space. Last question. This is a new, uh, that includes Poland and Hungary uh, and others uh, actually ready to shape global rules for free speech and uh, for free speech. What do you mean? An EU where there are countries um, where media freedom is under attack, uh, where free speech is actually uh, a luxury for some, but not for everybody. But it is, you know, it is so painful that we have had to go through uh, these years of uh, the Article 7 procedures, uh, now we have uh, new tools because it's so fundamental. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Margarita Skinas is even uh, Commissioner and Vice President for, uh, for the European way of life. And, and freedom of expression uh, and media plurality is, you know, at the very, very heart uh, of that way of life. Um, and, and one of the reasons why both digital proposals sort of stays away from, from, from saying on substance what is illegal, what is legal, is of course to leave room for, for member states, uh, but to, to use sort of the procedures of transparency, the procedures of democracy, uh, to make sure that people do have freedom of expression. Vice President, uh, I would like to thank you very much for this conversation, as I'm told, uh, we need to, to wrap up here. Uh, it was a pleasure. How time you runs when you're with someone in person. Well, it is. Thank you. Thank you really very much for, for coming and for, uh, for talking to us. I would uh, just wrap up with a look at our poll again, if we, if we can have that. Uh, so there's 300 people who participated. Um, should the EU impose a strict quota for gender parity on boards of listed companies? Yes, say 53%, um, uh, something uh, less strict, say 32%, and uh, there's a 15% who say no. I would like to ask you as a really last question, what do you, uh, as, a, as a reaction, as a quick reaction, what do you make of this? Well, that the time is now. We have waited for so long, so please now let us have it. Uh, because. Otherwise, if we don't take decisive action, change only happens in hundreds of years. Thank you very much for that. It was my pleasure. Margrethe Vestar, uh, for, for being with us. I would like to uh, thank you, our, our audience online, for having followed us and for your questions, for the participation in the poll. I would like to uh, thank our partner Salesforce for making this whole event possible with these two interviews today. Um, and uh, all, I, all that remains for me to do is to uh, remind you and to invite you to check our website, politico.eu events, uh, future events for anything that's coming up. And there is a lot coming up, as I happen to know. So thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye and see you soon. Goodbye.